Good morning and welcome to worship at APCH. No matter where you are joining us from, we pray that this hour together will be a blessing as we take in music and the word and the holy sacrament of communion. At the end of the service, we will participate in the Lord's Supper together. So now is a good time for you to press pause and gather bread and prepare a cup for you and your household. Next Sunday at 11 o'clock on Zoom, we will have our annual congregational meeting. The Zoom link has been sent out via email. If you haven't received it, contact the church office. If you don't plan to come but would still like to vote, also contact us and we will send you absentee ballots for you to return. If you need assistance or have any other questions, let us know. Today marks the first Sunday of Lent. And depending which church tradition you come from, that might mean different things, or it might mean nothing at all. For APCH, we add the sacrament of the Lord's Supper every week for these Sundays of Lent. Some churches take away singing the Alleluia. But regardless, with adding, with subtracting, all of these things invite us to a more cruciform way of life an inward reflection and posture of penitence as we take this journey to the cross. So with that in mind, our worship goes straight to confession. And as we head toward confession, hear these words from the book of Hebrews. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Let us consider him who endured such opposition from sinful people so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's worship together. Goodness, I 
My brothers and sisters, receive this good news and be at peace with the God who loves you. Those who love me, I will deliver, says the Lord. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them and show them my salvation.
The forgiveness of sins that we proclaim does more than mend our relationship with God. It also mends our relationships with each other when we offer repentance and forgiveness with those around us. And even more, it calls us into a unity of believers who are on mission together. Mission through the power of the Holy Spirit to testify to God's goodness and to work within this community to make the saving power of the gospel known. We do this through financial support and the generous offerings of time and talent to serve the church. The church is not an enterprise by which we get to sit back and consume its products, but rather it is the people of God working to bring light to the darkness and hope to the hopeless. With all the glory going to God's holy name. We hope you will join us in this mission. Later in this service, we'll gather around the table of grace as a united body of believers under one faith, one hope, and one Lord. As a sign of that unity, then, let us recall the words of the Apostles' Creed, words from centuries ago that join the church of all times and all places together under that one Lordship of Christ. My brothers and sisters, In whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good day, everybody. Before our scripture reading today, I would love to use this opportunity to bid farewell and to say a huge, huge thank you to Pastor Mark, to the council, and to every member of the APCH family for the great, great support that was given to me, especially during the heat of the COVID. Indeed, I was hungry and you fed me. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was in need of a shelter and you provided a roof over my head. And for that, I'm immensely grateful And I hope to pass this on as much as my resources will enable me. And my prayer is that God will continue to shower each and every one of you with his blessings and increase you on every side. In Jesus' name, amen. And so today our scripture reading will be taken from the book of Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is a lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in bands, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, 
which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the, peg for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And this is the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. On this first Sunday of Lent, I'm grateful to God to be with you, all of us together in the Spirit, learning from Jesus. I'm here in the, the hallway up the stairs from down below, near the balcony and the entrance to the offices, with the tapestry that used to hang almost unnoticed in the back of the sanctuary. But when the sanctuary was being painted, we moved it here. And now as you walk up or down or see it from below, you notice Jesus promising us, his people, that he will be always with us through whatever we have to face. And then the cross in the center assures us that through his life for us, we belong to God forever. And so let's pray that he will teach us as his people. Lord Jesus Christ, as you spoke your word on the mountain 2,000 years ago, you still speak your word by your spirit within us and through your gift of these words. So transform us to your glory, our joy, and for the blessing of this world. In your name we pray, amen. What is your goal in life? What do you really desire? That's what Jesus asks us to consider carefully today. He's been teaching the people on the mountain in Galilee and us now with them about the good life. He calls it a righteousness more beautiful by far than the holy leaders of his day. It's the right way of living in God's presence, trusting in God, listening to his voice, so that in our lives we honor God and live the right way for our own sake and for the world. At the center of the sermon last week, Jesus taught us that our devotion to God will be key in enjoying the good life and learning it. It'll not be something that we broadcast to others. It'll be our life in God. And then from there, people will see our life in God in the way we live. And after that center, Jesus now teaches us what that will mean with regard to money. It's the, the ever-tempting alternative to trusting in God. Money, wealth, or as the older versions of the gospel translated it, mammon. That godlike reality that pretends to offer what only God can truly provide. Money we can touch, and with it we can buy things that make us happy, and we can store it away to give us a sense of security. But it's not all it's cracked up to be, Jesus says. Moths can chew through wool. Other things like vermin or rust can eat away your possessions. Pandemics can shut down businesses. Markets can crash. Inflation can devour your wealth. Illness can shatter your dreams. Choose carefully your goal in life, Jesus says. Desire what is truly life-giving and joy-producing and completely trustworthy. Then all the rest will fall in place. Do you remember what C.S. Lewis said about our longings? It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, 
fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. Such important words and as relevant today as when they were spoken long ago by the word of God, Jesus. There is so much in this passage to explore, we'll not be able to cover it in a short time. But here, two things. One, the clear contrast between the two ways of living, which we all must choose between. And secondly, the diverse ways that we each will be led in. First, the clear contrast between two ways of living. Ever since God formed us, his people of faith, in the Old Testament, God always warned us that there were two ways of living, the way of life and the way of death. And we needed and need to choose one or the other, which we will follow, God has always said. The way of life or the way of death, the way of self or the way of God, the way of culture and the gods or powers or influences of the culture, or the way of God's kingdom known so fully and beautifully in Jesus. You heard that same clear contrast in Jesus' words. You can store up treasures. Literally, you can treasure treasures that are only temporary and vulnerable. Or you can treasure treasures that God, the world's creator and provider, promises are eternal and secure and give greater joy in all things than you can imagine. Your eyes can keep focusing on those things in life that keep you in the dark about what is truly good and beautiful. Or the eyes of your focus can be on what gives light and life and joy in all things. You can live in and for God our Father, or you can live for and under the control of money and wealth, the temporary deceptive power that will never last. You can't have it both ways. Perhaps just one verse from the first half of Jesus' teaching today will help you reflect on which of the two contrasts you, even as I too, have to reflect on this and pray before God about, to know what we're truly focused on or attending to. In Matthew 6, verse 21, Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think a lot of Christians want to read this the other way around. We imagine that Jesus said, For where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. That is, if you believe in and love Jesus, then it doesn't matter what you have for money or wealth or poverty. It all follows your love in Jesus. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In effect, he says, what you treasure in life, what you strive after, spend your time and energy dreaming and worrying about, what you pursue, what you preserve carefully, what you grow, that will show where your heart is. If you treasure money and wealth, it will monopolize your time and attention. Everything else will take second place to it. Even Christ, though Christ and his people may be a small part of your life, even a moderate size, but they'll come under the umbrella of money and wealth that you seek most of all. But if you treasure Jesus and the kingdom of God, then everything will have a life-giving part in God's good life for you. From the way you hold or share what you possess, to the way you see people, 
from the way you spend your time to the way you treat God's creation and so much more. Be careful, Jesus says. Mammon, that power of money and wealth, promise much more than they can deliver. The power of mammon is far more destructive and dangerous than you know. It can do the same thing that perhaps the ring did in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Do you know the ring? So powerful and attractive and yet so potentially destructive to those whom it possessed. Gollum had it and lost it. Before he had it, he was a happy, healthy hobbit who lived in the Shire and fished in the rivers and enjoyed life with his family and friends. But after he came into possession of the ring, or we should say after the ring took possession of him, he gradually lost the good life that he had. The ring was all that mattered to him, the ring that promised and gave him so much, but with it, destruction. He became old and lonely, small and slimy, unable to stand the light of the sun or even the moon. His life was about possessing the ring. My precious, my precious. Money can be like that. Mammon, so attractive and alluring, will destroy the good life within you and all around you unless you follow the way of God, your creator. Hear Jesus calling you, and as I hear Jesus calling me, to know and serve God as a good and trustworthy master of life who's able to put that powerful ring, the godlike mammon, wealth and possessions, in their rightful place and bless and lead you and me more and more in the good life. What is your goal in life? What are you striving after? What do you really desire? Pray in silence with me for a moment, being honest with God about what you either need to confess about your desires or about what you ask God to bless more and more in your desire for him. That's the clear contrast between which we all must choose. And secondly, there are the diverse ways that each of us will follow. When we follow Jesus, when we serve God instead of being controlled by mammon, by money and wealth, then God will help us understand how everything in life has its place in the kingdom. Our life in God isn't just spiritual. It's as real as houses and streets, clothing and food, bread and wine. And each of us, in following Jesus together, will learn to discern what the good life calls us to for the sake of our lives in Jesus and for the sake of the church, God's people, and the world around us. When Jesus says, don't worry about what you eat or drink or what you'll wear, he's not saying, don't think about those things. He's saying, don't let food or clothing have such an important place in your life that they rule you and that you're worried or anxious about them. They are my gifts to you, God says. Put them in their rightful place. I'll provide for you through your abilities to work and earn. And when that's not possible, through the help of my community, God's, uh, God's church, God's people. To assist you. When God says, don't worry about your food and drink, look at the birds, God provides for them. God's not saying that you don't have to go out and do the work you're called to do. Birds have to go out and look for God's providential ways 
He's saying instead, look at how God provides for the, wor- for the birds. He cares all the more for you. Trust in God. Put God first and your work and provision and life itself will all fall into place or be understood well as you grow in him. Don't you know that God provides for the flowers of the field and you're more profoundly beautiful and important to God, you who are created in his, in his image, than the flowers of the field are. So all the more you can trust that God will provide for you. God, throughout his word, blesses us with work, gives us gifts and callings that provide for us, gives us community to help us in difficult times. The word of God teaches us that we must be wise and diligent to provide for life, all of it, which is under his care and provision. In every generation, in each of our situations, we will need to discern what is right and just and good for preparing for the future calling of God, even in retirement. Jesus is saying, seek the kingdom and you'll understand more and more God's values and live in them. And you'll know God's way of providing for you so profoundly and you'll trust in that, even during hard times. He's saying, don't let food or drink, clothes or houses, experiences or bank accounts ever become my precious. They don't have the power to give you life in the way it was always intended. Rather, seek first the kingdom and God's righteousness, God's right living in the world, and all the rest will be given to you as well. It'll fall into place. Here's where the adventure of life grows for you and me in following Jesus. The call to seek is not a once and done call. It's a continual seeking. This this passage today, these verses, seek the kingdom, come as fresh to me and you today as they did the first time. We're always growing in seeking to know God, his will and his values, and how we can live in them faithfully. If we settle into what we have now and assume it will stay just like this or get better, we're essentially saying to Jesus, I don't want you to mess with my financial situation. That's my precious. I like it just as it is. If we say that, then we reveal that we're really not open to following the way of God, whatever that will mean in us. Freeing us from clutching everything to ourselves and opening us to the world and to live in the kingdom of God for the sake of others and God's glory. Here are some ways that you and I might grow in that. First, reflect upon, read about the role of money and wealth for life. Knowing the powerful force that mammon, money and wealth can be in life, We ought to be growing throughout our lives to know how Jesus would have us hold and keep and share all that he's given to us. But but we can do that better with each other, with reading some of the gifted writers of God's people who have helped shape the truth in, in generations in the past but also in doing it together in groups, asking the question, let's, let's read a book together, and then we can talk about money and the role it plays in our, in our own lives. You might read, for example, on the whole Sermon on the Mount, the classic of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship, or the more contemporary, Dallas Willard's The Divine Conspiracy. Both of them have been important guides in members of the life of this church. Or you could read, for example, Richard Foster's book on the gods of this age entitled Money, Sex, and Power. And let it inform you with others how we can live with these faithfully, these gifts, but also these challenges in this life. Throughout life, we ought to be growing in all these areas of our discipleship. Money and wealth is one important one in this day and age where money itself is such a god. 
if it's important for you, then don't let just your mind resolve this, but be nurtured by others in the Christian community. Learn, read, meditate with others. Secondly, take steps to resist the rule of mammon, of the god of money and wealth. One way that God gives us is part of our discipleship is to tithe. Uh, that word in the Old Testament meant that you always gave 10% as God's calling requirement for God's people. But in the New Testament, since Christ, he's freed us from rigid rules. And instead, when we say tithe, we mean shorthand for giving offerings of joyful thanksgiving for all that God has done through, for us in Jesus Christ. It, it means growing in the discipline of giving weekly or monthly offerings of thanksgiving to the life of God's church and ministry here, but to other ministries as well and supporting others around the world. Grow in the discipline of tithing, of giving, whether that means 10% as a basic expectation or model, whether that means only 5% because you haven't even been able to give 1% or 2% and you want to grow in this, or whether it means God's blessed you with so much that 10% is really not enough of a reflection of our gratitude. Grow in that as a prophetic witness in your own mind and heart and in the world that money does not control us. Or say enough is enough. Perhaps you don't need to buy that new item this year. Perhaps you have enough generally clothes to wear. Perhaps we don't need to worry about getting our hair cut right now. Life is more important than hair, Jesus might say. Laugh at commercials or advertisements that promise that if you buy this or wear that, you will be made into a brand new, young, lively person. Teach your children not to pursue a job that makes a lot of money. Teach your children to seek to know what God's calling, God's vocation is for them. What are their gifts and interests and passions? And how might God provide for them in that way, whether making significant money and using it for God's kingdom, or whether not making significant money and dwelling secure in God's care. Or in individual ways. I had a friend once who was buying a new car. He was going to buy the standard basic model. And then the dealer said, you know what, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you all the bells and whistles for just 3% more. And he could afford it. He decided though that since he was raising his children, he ought to take the standard model so that they would know they didn't need all the bells and whistles in life, so that they would know that they could use some of that money for the sake of others as well. You and I will each grow in different ways to resist the power of mammon and to learn how to grow in the trust and goodness and generosity of God through our own lives. Learn resist mammon, and thirdly, most foundationally, grow in your delight of God and in trusting his care. Follow Jesus, the word of God, who on the cross died for your and my sins, who in his resurrection life promises he's always with us through thick and thin, through challenges and blessings, God is with us, Jesus is leading us. Meditate on his word daily. It's been a life-giving practice of God's people for thousands of years. Psalm 19 says that God's word, that is God's values and God's gifts and God's commands, are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. And if you don't experience that, if you don't find God's word to be this gift greater than money itself, then talk to people who do know that, who live out of that joy always, and they'll help you grow in that. And so grow in the life of Jesus, even as he modeled it for us. Philippians 2 says, 
He gave up the glory of heaven to come and become one of us and then to become a servant who would die on the cross for all of us, for your and my salvation. Grow in the way of Jesus. Let him pour his life more and more into you. Delight in God and learn to trust more and more in his care. It's that life that Jesus makes real and beautiful today in the Lord's Supper. It's the meal of the kingdom of God. And as we take and eat, Jesus nourishes our body. It's a sign of God's continual feeding and helping us, providing for us. But it's also this gift by which Jesus, through faith, is nourishing our own hope and trust and confidence in him. What are your goals in life? Seek first the kingdom of heaven and Jesus' right living, his righteousness, and you'll never miss out on anything of value for you and the world around you because God is with you, leading you all the way. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. We seek your kingdom. Lord Jesus, by your word and spirit, grow your kingdom in us more and more so that we can put in the right place all the gifts you give us and that we can be ourselves witnesses and signs of your generosity and goodness in this world. In your name we pray, amen. It's Jesus' gift of provision, both for our bodies and for the core of our being, for the ways we look at and live life, the Lord's Supper. And so, with this taste of the goodness of God and of his provision in every way, read with me the opening. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And so let's pray together. We honor you, Lord God, creator and sustainer of everything that is. We praise and thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your inexpressible gift to us of our new life of your promise to us that your death provides for our life, that your suffering, the punishment of our sins, satisfies all of the punishment we deserve and frees us to live anew in great joy before you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your grace to come into our lives and for nourishing us with your word and growing it in us to your glory. So, as we pray, hear us in the words you taught us, Lord Jesus, as we, for the sake of the world and our lives in it, pray this prayer in the language that is most common to us to pray in. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Listen to the call of God for us to celebrate. From the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. People of God, 
How do you respond to this gift and call of God? We shall do as our Lord commands. We proclaim that our Lord Jesus was sent by the Father into the world, that he took upon himself our flesh and blood and bore the wrath of God against our sin. We confess that he was condemned to die, that we might be pardoned, and suffered death, that we might live. We proclaim that he is risen to make us right with God, and that he shall come again in the glory of his new creation. This we do now, and until he comes again. And so let us celebrate this gift in our homes, but united by God's Spirit as his community with all his people all around the world. As we are in our home, your home, uh, and as you are in yours, God joins us as the family of God, and so let's pray together before we receive this meal, this gift. Thank you, Lord God, for making your saving gift to us so real that we can taste and eat and drink it. Bless our bodies with the food, and then our spirits, our souls, our hearts, with new life continually from you. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. The bread which we break is the sharing in the body of Christ. The cup for which we give thanks is the sharing in the blood of Christ. And so take the bread, share it with each other, and we'll receive it together. Take, eat, remember and believe that the body and blood of Jesus was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Amen. Take the cup, share it with each other, and then take, drink. Remember and believe that the blood of Jesus was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Amen. Pray with me. We bless you, O Lord for your grace and goodness, and ask that as we leave from this worship service, that you will strengthen our faith and our joyful obedience in you, so that we are witnesses of your goodness for the life of the world. In your name we pray, amen.
as you go out in this week, or if God calls you to stay home, receive this gift of God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ forgive you of all your sin. The love of God the Father overflow into your life with his provision and his care, whether through suffering or blessing. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit unite us all as God's community, local or around the world and through all times, to live to God's glory through Jesus Christ. Amen. In peace, live to serve God in the world.